Diverticular disease is where you have outpouchings of the colonic mucosa and underlying connective tissue through the colon wall. Diverticular disease are acquired outpouchings, which make them a false diverticular. And we'll compare between true and false in this video. Let's begin by first recapping the anatomy of the colon. Here we have the cecum, the beginning of the colon, ascending, transverse, descending, sigmoid, and the rectum. It's important to note that the sigmoid is where most diverticula occur in the Western country. However, in Asian populations, this occurs more predominantly on the right side, so around the ascending and the hepatic flexure slash transverse colon. Before I continue, it is important to know the terminology. So a diverticulum is one outpouching. Diverticula is plural, multiple outpouchings. Diverticulosis is the presence of diverticula, which is usually asymptomatic, so no symptoms. And diverticular disease is an umbrella term which can present um, as either symptomatic or asymptomatic, and it's an umbrella term for a variety of conditions involving the diverticula. So let's cut a cross-section of the colon and just recap some important structures. The colon is made up of many layers. Here we have the lumen, and here a longitudinal muscle uh, fiber known as the tinea coli. And we have three of these surrounding the colon. And then we have blood vessels which supply the colon wall. And these blood vessels originate from the inferior mesenteric arteries. And these blood vessels then penetrate through part of the colon wall to supply the surrounding tissue. In diverticular disease, you have diverticulosis, the presence of a lot of these outpouchings within the colon. These outpouchings can be divided into either true or false diverticula. And there's a difference. The difference is that when you have a true diverticulum, all the layers are involved in the outpouching. So all the layers of the colon wall is involved in the outpouching. However, in a false diverticula, it's only the mucosa and the submucosa that, that is involved in the outpouching. The muscle layer remains the same. And it is the false diverticulum, which is the acquired diverticulum. And this is what we see in the adult population. Whereas a true diverticulum is what we see in infants. This is a congenital problem. Diverticulosis is essentially the presence of a lot of diverticula. And so this is usually asymptomatic. However, in diverticular disease, there is usually symptoms. One of the causes of these symptoms is diverticulitis which is inflammation of a diverticulum or diverticula. And this inflammation causes pain and some bowel problems. If we zoom into what happens during inflammation, we see the presence of neutrophils infiltrating the area. And this leads to the signs and symptoms we see in diverticular disease. In diverticular so disease, in diverticular we can divide disease, the clinical a majority of the people the are asymptomatic. Into they have a lot of these outpouchings, groups. and it doesn't cause any problems. However, there can be painful diverticular disease, and this is usually pain at the lower iliac fossa on the left. And this is, remember, the sigmoid area where in Western uh, countries, um, diverticular disease predominates. However, painful diverticular disease often coexists with irritable bowel disease, and so there is some confusion. The third way of presentation is when there's bleeding diverticular disease, and this is usually large volume of dark red blood. What is the cause of this? Well, if we have many outpouchings here, the blood vessels that supply the area can rupture. So we have rupture of a peri-diverticular submucosal blood vessel, resulting in the blood entering the lumen and then going out as stool, forming the large volume of dark red blood. The fourth way diverticular disease can present is with diverticulitis, which is inflammation of a diverticulum. 
and this presents with usually nausea, fever, tachycardia, acute left iliac fossa pain in Western countries, and also loose stools. So again, those are the four ways diverticular disease can present. Majority of people are asymptomatic, causes no problems. Then you have painful diverticular disease, you have bleeding diverticular disease, and then you have diverticulitis. The risk factors for diverticular disease or forming diverticular include age, because it's majority in an, in an older population, being male, obese, having a low fiber diet, certain medications such as non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, corticosteroids, and exercise as well. Let us now look at the pathophysiology of uh, diverticular disease or how a false diverticulum forms. In order, to, in order to do this, we must zoom into the layer of the colon here and recap the layers of the colon itself. So here we have the lumen. The first layer which interacts with the lumen is the mucosa and the submucosa. Then we have the muscle layer, the muscularis, and then the serosa. Remember, the branches of the inferior mesenteric artery supplies the colon. And so here we have the artery, which is a branch of the inferior mesenteric artery supplying the colon. And it's actually penetrating inside the colon wall to supply the mucosa and submucosa. Well, it's actually in this area where the artery penetrates the colon wall where diverticulum can form because this is essentially a weak spot. When pressure builds up within the lumen due to various reasons, the site where the artery penetrates the colon wall is a site of weakness and therefore a diverticulum can form, an outpouching can form involving only the mucosa and submucosa layers. So again, here we have the penetrating artery, which is a weak spot, and the high pressure within the lumen also contributes to the formation of the diverticulum, the false diverticulum. It's also important to note that the sigmoid, where most of the di diverticula occur, is the narrowest part of the colon, and so this will mean that there is greater pressure in the area. The pathogenesis of diverticulitis, which is inflammation of a diverticulum, is thought to be due to the microflora or fecal impactment for that matter. So if there's an outpouching, a, a fecal can just lodge in there and block the site, causing some form of uh, um, ischemia type necrosis, and this will cause an inflammatory process. Or, or another thought is that the gut bacteria that lives within the colon actually initiates the inflammatory process. Now it's important to talk about the complications of diverticular disease, and there are many, mainly abscess formation, diverticulitis itself, perforation, where a diverticulum can perforate, and this can then lead to the formation of a fistula. A fistula is a tunnel formed by, you can say, two hollow organs. And in the case of a perforated diverticula, it can actually form a fistula with the bladder. And so when it forms this fistula with the bladder here, the urinary bladder, it can cause some signs and symptoms. This is known as a colon vesicular fistula. And when this happens, the bacteria which normally reside in the colon can go into the bladder, causing UTIs, and also the gas that is being produced can lead to bubbling when uh, you urinate. So you have uh, bubbles in your urine. Investigations that are performed for suspected diverticular disease include barium enema, which can reveal heaps of diverticular and also possible strictures and complications associated with diverticular disease. Then you have a colonoscopy, which essentially is where you have a camera inserted into the back passage. And this is good because you, you can see visual, visually, visualize the colon wall and go 
all the way around the colon and you can possibly find coexisting complications or even malignancy. Laboratory tests including full blood count and CRP is also used. CT scan is used to identify complications associated with diverticular disease. The management of diverticular disease can be divided into medical and surgical. Medical looks at diet, promoting high fiber diet and also drinking more water. Exacerbations of diverticulitis, there may, there may be a need for IV antibiotics, analgesia and fluids in hospital. Surgical management include resection, segmental colectomy, and indications for surgery include a perforation of a diverticulum, inflammation that fails to respond to medical treatment, undrainable abscess, and also a fistula formation.